First things first, take a look at the t-shirt, or at least the design. You can buy your own at Bunker Branding, help the channel, help my team, and anyway. How is daily life different in Ukraine than the rest of the world? So the first thing I want to say is that jammers, which are used on the front line to go and block GPS guided munitions, they're used all over the cities of Ukraine. Everybody in that city is going to be placed in the same spot, in the middle of a lake or in the middle of a field far away. This is trying to make it so that the missiles lock onto an area that doesn't really matter if it gets damaged, a lake. And it definitely kind of screws you up if you're not really used to the city that you're in. You have to then find a place next to you and try and find it on Google Maps and then uh, write in the address specifically rather than just clicking on the map. So yeah, that's one big thing, at least for me. And the next one is something that my family does not believe, no matter how many times I try and tell them. If you are beyond 10 kilometers from the front line, you're going to be living a pretty normal life. You're not going to be at the threat of pretty much anything except for maybe a couple of missiles, but that's that's everywhere. And we're going to get into the missile problem here. It's a very unfortunate fact of Ukraine, but not all of Ukraine is a war zone, okay? Everybody's in threat of missiles. Everybody's in threat of some sort of munitions, maybe some saboteurs earlier in the war, but it's very, very safe here. It is martial law. There's block posts everywhere. There's military personnel everywhere. You're going to be far-fetched to find, you know, like a mass shooting or anything like that in Ukraine. There is so much security around and the front line, the artillery shells and stuff, they're not going to be reaching 10 kilometers beyond usually. Like if you're in Lviv, you're, you're going to be fine. You know, even if you're in like Slovyansk or Kramatorsk, other than missiles, can you say you're going to be targeted by artillery right now? No. The next one, talking about the military personnel being everywhere. Military shops are also everywhere. The economy adapts to what is the need in the country. And there's a lot of homegrown Ukrainian brands that are producing and making everything in Ukraine and it's military gear and it's very good. You can barely walk down any street without finding some sort of military shop, which is kind of cool. You know, back home in the US, that would just be like airsoft stores, like I guess. But this is a legitimate straight from the factory, good gear and anything you could you could buy anything you would want, tourniquets, medical gear, and they're everywhere. The next one is that not every civilian thinks about the war 24 seven, right? This war has been going on for arguably 10 years, you know, uh, two and a half years of this full scale invasion. Just like Americans, how it doesn't captivate their mind all the time, you know, the Ukrainian war, it's kind of the same here. Everybody has a story of the war and how it's impacted them. Either they know family members passed away or injured or know somebody in the service still and everybody has that a part of their life but it doesn't captivate them it's not like they're the forefront of their mind 24 7. people have normal social lives people go to bars people enjoy themselves and you know war is just it's a part of their identity at this current state of ukraine fighting for its independence and two and a half years in could you focus on something so tragic I know I couldn't. I always need breaks from Ukraine or different wars. But yeah, that's the that's the same for the civilians of Ukraine. Daily life. The next one I already mentioned a little bit is block posts are on every single crossroad. So what are block posts? They're checkpoints. Military checkpoints with border guards, policemen, that sort of thing. And it, it kind of looks like cinder blocks that are in different ways that you can't just speed through. Okay, so they put cinder blocks on the street. And you have to slow down, weave your way in, show your passport to the border guard or policeman. Uh, sometimes they'll just ask you like is everything good where are you going and they just want to keep tabs on who's crossing and they want to have the ability to stop anybody this is completely normal in any war zone that i've ever been in iraq especially going from shengal to the city that we were going to maybe an eight hour drive we passed by like 30 something checkpoints very normal it helps internal security it's just gonna be a part of your your driving habit any city that you're passing through you're gonna be crossing through one or two block posts the next one we're gonna start talking about missiles a little bit Look, I'm in a hotel right now, and before you go into a hotel, especially more out west in Lviv, where there's a lot of a lot more tourism than uh, where I am right now, you're gonna have to sign a little pamphlet, a little like paper, before you check into a hotel, saying if you die in a horrific explosion, it's not our fault, you know, and you know the proper protocol for taking cover. So this means here's the stairwell, here's the basement. If you hear an alarm, you are supposed to go to this area, and. They're supposed to explain this to you unless you're in like an area that everybody signed it kind of knows like you have to do that but a lot of people ignore it i have never went to a basement in a while if i die in a fire explosion that is my fault it is what it is not everybody's focused on the war like i mentioned earlier everybody's kind of used to it and they accept the danger of missiles and they're not gonna wake up at 2 a.m because there's an air raid alarm most of the time, especially this time of year, it is constant, 24 seven air raids. If you're traveling here, most do not speak a lick of English. Not their fault, they're Ukrainians. We're supposed to learn their language in order to adapt into their society. But yeah, uh, make sure you have a translator handy if you're just stopping by or maybe you're like me and you don't really have time to really divulge yourself into learning lessons and taking courses on 
I'm learning this language. Nobody really knows English, not their fault. Try and learn as much as you can or have a translator app, it's essential. And depending on what oblast or whatever city that you're in in Ukraine, you have a good chance of seeing a burnt out tank or burnt out vehicle of the Russians on the side of the road. There's areas in Kiev that you can see these burnt out tanks, but when you're just driving down the road and they'll put up a, like a city sign on it or like a village sign because nobody has time to move this giant hunk of metal that's just burned to the ground. So yeah, you're gonna see the cost of war everywhere. And it's especially unfortunate because even in cities that you would deem safe, like Kiev or even Kharkiv to a point, you're gonna see a lot of destroyed houses. The damage of this war is everywhere, and especially out east, you're gonna see destroyed buildings and apartments everywhere. Oh yeah, let's speak about food. Shashlik and shawarma. Those are gonna be your diets, all right? There's no McDonald's. Like You have to think of Ukraine kind of like, I don't know, Kansas or Nebraska. It's, it's just farm fields, and then there's some cities that pocket, maybe some small towns, but you're not gonna have these name brand stuff anywhere. And if you go to a small village, you can go like 40 miles without finding like a pizza place. It's it's very normal just to have shawarma and shashlik. Shashlik is um sorry barbecue. Okay, so just cooked meats. It's really good. Uh, they'll always offer you borscht. You'll you'll find borscht anywhere. There's cool cafes. It's I mean it's kind of fun to eat in Ukraine. I enjoy the food, but that's kind of what to expect. If you're in Kharkiv, if you're in especially Kiev, you're gonna find some more name brand stuff, and it's gonna seem a lot more Western than the eastern parts of the country. The next one is that not everybody is good with the idea of continuing this war with Russia. I certainly am. This is why I joined the Ukrainian military, but there are a lot of people, especially older people and out East, not a lot, but you know, 10% of the population maybe that do not agree with this. And they want to, they want to stop this war. They're Ukrainians. You know, they get, they have the freedom of speech. They have the freedom of their own thoughts, but sometimes they're a lot more vocal than you would expect, especially in Ukraine in a time of war against this invader. So if you're going out east and you meet these people, I, I would just recommend just shut your mouth, let them, let them be, <laughs> you know, they're free to have the thought that they want, but uh, yeah, uh, you might encounter that. I've encountered a couple over the course of two years, but the vast majority, again, probably 99% of the people I've met that have been vocal to me have been very supportive of the military and uh, fighting out this, this Russian aggressor. And speaking of the war a little bit more, when it comes to older men, you're gonna be far-fetched to find people between the ages of like 40 and 50 that are not in military uniform or injured. This is the vast majority of the of the conscripts and the volunteers that Ukraine has. So you'll notice on the streets, you're not gonna see people of that age group so much just kind of walking around. They are on the front lines. And I just want to mention that. It's it's an interesting thing if you, if you start looking out for it. The next one is very sad. There's a lot of disabled soldiers, okay? Something very typical, probably after the Vietnam War, you probably see in the U.S. Um, not so much the Iraq War, but yeah, there's there's a lot of people that are walking around with missing limbs, or they have you know a back problem, or you know a limp. You're gonna see this young people, old people, mostly 40 to 55. You know that age bracket that's being conscripted or volunteering. So you're gonna see this. It's gonna be very common. Make sure to give them the time of day. Open a door for them if they need. Uh, just. Be respectful of their people. But the destruction and mark of war that I was talking about isn't just the buildings, it is obviously the human lives. Uh, so there's a lot of people who are injured. The next one is power outages. Depending on the time of year, depending on what Russia has in store for Ukraine, you're gonna have power outages. Uh, they are purposely, especially in the winter time, targeting energy infrastructure in order to make blackouts in the cities. And that way the city has to go to the reserves and start rationing off different sections of the city to have time uh, or electricity in certain times of the day. And when these power outages happen, it's gonna take about a week to get that thing back up and running. And you're gonna hear a lot of generators. The generators are gonna be outside every store pumping out diesel fumes. And it's just is what it is. People are used to it. This is why they all have generators outside their buildings or inside in the back or whatever. It is very common depending on what city you're in. And the last one, I just wanna reiterate, the war is not everywhere, okay? I mean, it's kind of everywhere, but it's not to, to what you would expect. You're not gonna be hearing artillery shells. You're not gonna be hearing gunshots and stuff. It's a very safe living environment. It's, you know, you have a chance of getting hit by a missile, probably the same chance of, I don't know, like a, a thunderstrike or something, maybe a little bit more, but like it's it's on that level. And it's just something to keep in mind. Ukraine is a very safe country, uh, and, unless you're a soldier. Thanks again for listening. I hope you guys learned something. This is kind of the, w the weird things about daily life in Ukraine that I just want to mention. And again, if you want to support the channel, Bunker Branding would really appreciate it if you could uh, pick up a shirt. 
Anyway, thanks to the members as well. You guys really help our unit out. And I just really appreciate your support, being able to buy these batteries and all these, these weird things that we need for FPVs. So thanks again. See you guys in the next one. Peace.